Welcome back, friends. Um, the second secret, the topics would be um, the war, and that's the one. And the two, World War II, is now foretold. Communism, the consecration and devotion to the Immaculate um, Heart of Mary. The lady continues, you have seen hell where the souls of sinners go. To save them, God wishes to establish in the world devotion to my Immaculate Heart. If people do as I ask, many souls will be converted and there will be peace. Here's the promise. This war is going to end. So it's a promise or prediction. But if people do not cease offending God, not much more time, uh, not much time will elapse. And during the pontificate of Pius XI, another and more terrible war will begin. When you see a night illumined by an unknown light, so here's here that that would be the um, the vision. Know that this is the great sign that God gives that the chastisement of the world for its many transgressions is at hand through war, famine, persecution of the church, and of the Holy Father. To prevent this, I shall come to ask for the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart and the communion of reparation on the first Saturdays. If my requests are heard, Russia will be converted and there will be peace. If not, she will spread her errors throughout the entire world, fomenting wars and persecution of the church. The good will suffer martyrdom. The Holy Father will suffer much. Different nations will be annihilated. But in the end, my immaculate heart shall triumph. The Holy Father will consecrate Russia to me, which will be converted Russia will be converted and some time of peace will be granted to humanity on january the 25th through 26 1938 an extraordinary aurora borealis illuminated the night skies of europe and parts of america for almost five hours sister lucia regarded it as the god-given sign the next world war was near the first two secrets the children were given permission by Our Lady to reveal. The third secret was to be revealed in 1960. Actually, it's 1960 or the death of Sister Lucia, whichever would come first. But as it turns out, it would be 1960. It would be understood better, the third secret would be better understood at that time. Yeah, I think I think that's always one of the primary problems with prophecy, right? Is that it's so hard to believe the prophet because nothing's happening. You know, what what errors in 1917 and you know do we think Russia is going to spread? You know, we have we have I mean there's no possible cognizance of what could be coming because we don't even really have uh the concrete Bolshevik revolution at that point, right? The trend <laughs> And I think Lucia, if I'm not mistaken, if I read this correctly, she thought communism was the name of a an illicit woman. She did. It's kind of like um, Bernadette with the Immaculate Conception. She didn't really know what that word meant. Right. And I I bet you a dime to a donut. Uh, not many people in Portugal knew what the term communism meant either. Yeah. Yeah. Or anywhere else for that matter. Right. But but what should have been easily comprehensible was for the Pope to consecrate Russia. That is right. And that's going that's going to take us down a merry little jaunt. <laughs> right, exactly. Yes. And so it taught so Sarah we do not we do not uh, coordinate, <laughs> we just God in his great goodness. Use yeah. of reason and discernment. So now we're going to look to, to two parts because now we're going to be heading into the third secret and we need to kind of, what are our boundaries? Matthew 11, 2, 6. Always, always we go back to Christ. It's always Christocentric. 
every, every single time. Matthew 11, 2, 6. Now, when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are ye who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is he who takes no offense at me. Our Lord specifically directs John and his disciples to use their reason. He does not give a discourse on um, the three persons of the Blessed Trinity, and he's the second person you know, and all things were made by him and for him and the different attributes of the three persons. He doesn't do that. He could have, right? He's got, he could have done what he does. He says, what does your eyes and your intellect tell you? And then you draw a good conclusion from it. The thesis statement of canon law. So if, any, so if you want to know what canon law, the thesis statement of it is. Um, and I have, a, as always, all this is cite, cited in the footnotes. Now, this is the reason. So a thesis statement. Why is what is being written or proposed? Why are they doing it? It's the why. This is the why for canon law. Now, however, the law can no longer be unknown. Pastors have at their disposal secure norms by which they may correct, correctly direct the exercise of their sacred duty. Here's to us. To each person is given a source of knowing. So we really do have a source of knowing. His or her own proper rights and duties. Arbitrary, arbitrariness in acting can be precluded. Abuses. Abuses when we're not using our logic and our reason, which perhaps have crept into ecclesiastical discipline because of a lack of legislation, can be more easily rooted out and prevented. Canon 12, Section 1. Conscious of their own responsibility, the Christian faithful are bound to follow with Christian obedience those things which the sacred pastors, inasmuch as they represent Christ, declare as teachers of the faith or establish as rulers of the church. That goes back to what Sarah said not too long ago. You know, there are some things we cannot dispense with. Okay. Our presence being, for example, one of them. However, section two. The Christian faithful are free to make known to the pastors of the church their needs, especially spiritual ones, and their desires. Um, section 3. According to the knowledge, competence, and prestige which, which they possess, they have the right and even at times the duty, the laity, to manifest to the sacred pastors their opinion on matters which pertain to the good of the church and to make their opinion known to the rest of the Christian faithful, without prejudice to the integrity of faith and morals, they're not against faith and morals, with reverence toward the pastor, so in a in a you know proper and respectful way, and attentive to the common advantage and the dignity of persons. And the last citation is uh, from Canon 221, Section One. Lay persons are bound by the obligation and process and possess the right to acquire knowledge of Christian doctrine appropri appropriate to the capacity and condition of each in order for them to be able to live according to this doctrine, announce it themselves, defend it if necessary, and take their part in exercising uh, the apostolate. Mm -hmm. It's a heavy burden. It's a heavy burden. It's a heavy burden. I mean, burden. but it's also it's also a liberation, I guess, in some sense. I mean, we do have we can have confidence that if our Lord calls us to preach the gospel, He's not going to leave us without the means necessary to do so. That's so right. We have, we have confident assurance 
you know, that to to the level of our ability, we have we will have the the means with which to inform ourselves and um, and thereby, you know, be capable evangelists. That's right. That's right. All right, my friends. With that heavy preamble. <laughs> We are ready for the third secret. Right. Right. <laughs> Till then, my friends, fides, the ratio. <laughs>